is Yeah, it is live on uh, Facebook. Can we start? Uh, yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. Just I second. just shared it also on my page. I think yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Uh, good evening, friends. And uh, today we have uh, Professor uh, Sharada Srinivasan who is going to speak on uh, iron, uh, iron and other uh, metal metallurgy in the context of uh, South Indian megaliths, more particularly Tamil region, uh, based on her research. Uh, she is a um, very well experienced uh, scholar. And we are happy to have her here on this platform. And she will be presenting about her analysis of the metallurgical tradition of this uh, particular region. I am indeed happy that she has uh, accepted her, uh, in, uh, amidst her busy schedule, uh, to make this presentation on our request. I would like to thank her to formally uh, introduce, I request Dr. Uh, Arjun Rao uh, to introduce about her and her work. After that, we will listen to her work, uh, lecture. Thank you. Yeah. Arjun, please uh, introduce. Good evening, all. Uh, today, we have uh, Professor Sharda Srinivasan. She is a professor at the uh, National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore. Uh, she is one of the uh, few uh, archaeometallurgists we have in India, and we are very glad to hear to her uh, on this topic of some insights into megalithic or Iron Age and early historic metallurgy in Tamil region. Professor Sharda Srinivasan uh, received her PhD from the uh, Institute of Archaeology, University College London, UK, in 1996 on archaeometallurgy. Uh, topic, the enigma of the dancing Panchaloha icons, art, historical, and archaeometallurgical investigation on South Indian metal icons. Her area of interest and her area of specialization span across art history, archaeology, archaeological sciences, technical art history, archaeometallurgy, archaeomaterials, history of science and technology, scientific applications in the study of art and archaeological objects, and many other, including ancient mining and metal production and traditional technologies that we have inherited so far. She is also a recipient of the fourth highest civilian award, Padma Shri, in the last year for the subject of archaeology. On behalf of the, uh, all the participants and the Asian Megaliths platform, I Welcome, Professor Sharda Srinivasan, to deliver our talk. Welcome, ma'am. Over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajan Rao, for that very kind introduction. And thanks to you and Dr. Selva Kumar for um, this very kind invitation to speak on this Asian Megaliths platform. And let me first congratulate you on this very dynamic uh, um, group that you have uh, got going, which is been drawing together very interesting work on this um, very fascinating, but perhaps uh, little uh, known and rather enigmatic topic um, of uh, megaliths, not only in the Asian, but the Indian context. And uh, it's, it's a great privilege to uh, speak to you today. So um, I will... Uh, as, as mentioned by Dr. Rajin Rao, I'm uh, basically been working at the interface of uh, uh, archaeology and the scientific applications or art history and technical art history and so on. Um, so it's um, more uh, in terms of archaeometallurgy than as a field archaeologist that my experience 
comes to bear to this topic and ethno archaeology and so on. And of course, I realized somewhere along the way that this is really too vast a topic, uh, you know, megalithic iron age and early historic and so on to be able to cover in one talk. So I probably can only share, uh, will share some insights here and uh, perhaps. Uh, some of it will have to await a future talk and so on. So in fact, I won't be able to touch, I think, the topic of iron. I will primarily stick to the topic of uh, bronze, which had been um, an, a, the major focus of some of my work. And perhaps in another future topic, we'll revert to uh, some more. And perhaps um, uh, mainly focusing on the, uh, the Tamil megaliths and uh, so on. And, uh, a, a rather excavated material that's been, or unearthed material that's been lying in various museums because that's what one was more easily able to get access to study and such like. So now I'll go on to share my screen. Uh, yeah. Here, wait a um, is it shared? But this is not my first slide. Just yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we can see it, yes. You can see it, but this is not my yeah. first slide. So okay, I have okay. to try and go back to... Yeah, from the see. beginning. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, is this seen now? Just the first slide. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yes. So, um, of course, um, the topic of the archaeology of uh, the Tamil region has had a few uh, huge fillip due to, or rather, there's been a lot of momentum generated also in recent times due to the excavations at Kiridi, and you're seeing me there uh, near the site for which there were some carbon dates, dating it back to the sixth century BCE. And of course, one of the great enigmatic aspects of the megaliths is that uh, in earlier times, there were not many burial cohabitation sites which have been studied, but that has been happening more and more and uh, more and more interesting material has been uh, coming to light. And you're also looking at a very interesting uh, uh, vessel with a finial from one of the excavations in Oroville, uh, which I'll also touch upon here. So, um, yes. Well, of course, uh, you know, to people who um, know much about let's say the metal traditions, really the spectacular Chola bronzes that are associated with Southern India. And it's seen as a bit of a kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the, in the preceding periods is not much is really known in the wider public imagination at any rate. I mean, we know that there was a Bronze Age as far as the Harappan period is concerned, but uh, as far as Southern India is concerned, Yes, of course, the megalithic uh, context is described as Iron Age because there's a lot of finds of iron and so on. Um, and you're looking uh, typically at a very spectacular site, Hire Benkel, which is um, uh, with all these spectacular dolmens, which is dated to about 1000 BCE. So um, there is this association, of course, with these remarkable uh, ways of assembling stones and uh, a lot of finds of iron implements and so on. So we don't really associate uh, this period with uh, finds of bronze, but there is some interesting aspects to it, which I will carry on uh, to describe, which in a way, again, there's a lot of uh, confusion here. What, what is megalithic, what is Iron Age, what is uh, early historic and so on. So I, I, I don't really have time in this talk to uh, address all of those, but anyway, I'll, I will, I mean, look more at the artifacts and what we can say from those in any case. Um, and one of the well-known sites from Tamil Nadu, of course, is Kodumanal, which uh, is also one of the sites which has habitation come burial um, associations. And you see here, this is burial with dolmens, which is dated to the latter part of the first millennium BCE. And uh, you're also looking at the sarcophagus from Suttakini, which is near Arikimedu, which goes back to Kassel's excavations around uh, 1950s or so, which is uh, in the Musee Gime, where you see this very spectacular terracotta uh, uh, sarcophagus. And uh, there have been finds of some gold from Suttakini and so on. Um, and we do know that the megalithic and the Iron Age, again, the megalithic extends, uh, you know, uh, of course, we associated with the 
of some part of the first millennium BC, but then it also seems to extend into the Christian era and maybe the early Christian era and so on. So there are all of these aspects of the chronology and so on. Um, but I guess one of the exciting aspects of the excavations at Kiriti has been the fact that uh, the site, which is uh, uh, just in the outskirts of Madurai, immediately seems to resonate with the uh, Tamil Sangam epics. And for instance, the Shilapadikaram, which talks of uh, in the Madurai Kandam, speaks of the streets of Madurai and so on, and is along the Vaigai. And so uh, th th there have been, of course, some carbon dates found which are attributed to 6th century BC and also some Tamil Brahmi graffiti on pottery, which is probably of the 2nd century BC and so on. And uh, as far as, and also uh, Kiriri also uh, yielded some pottery with graffiti, which uh, seems to carry forward some of the signs, or at least so it's, it's speculated, which seem to hark back to the um, Indus Valley signs, as, as I've illustrated here uh, in one of the pot sheds. And you're also looking at the ring well uh, in Kiriri. Well, um, and Kiriri also has some finds of gold, uh, this floral gold motif and bead and so on. And again, you see those kinds of beads uh, also seem to hark back to the kind of gold beads that you see um, in, in the Harappan period. But of course, to say, I mean, these kinds of associations are, you know, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really trying to uh, very firmly make those kinds of correlations, except to say that in the absence of uh, a, a lot of context, it is interesting to point out, you know, that there are some kinds of um, uh, objects or technologies which seem to, uh, you know, there, there's some analogies that you can make and such like. And uh, here again, I just mentioned Sutukenis. You're seeing a very beautiful, uh, the gold earring from Sutukeni. Um, and uh, Arichinalur, of course, uh, was a site which uh, was unearthed in the uh, uh, 19th century by Jagor and then the early 20th century also by Alexander Ray. And there are a lot of finds there of uh, gold diadems and so on, uh, such as what you're looking at. And Arichinur also was excavated more recently and uh, uh, yielded some urns and so on, burials which were dated to about 900 BCE. And you're looking at this rather well-known um, pot shirt with ha which has uh, the depiction of an antelope and um, a lady and so on. So um, I think the more we, uh, take archaeology further, the more there is for us to, to look at and to understand. The other aspect that has been of interest to me is that, you know, tradition in a way, it's not uh, totally um, you know, a dead one. When you look at it from an archaeological point of view, that's the way we see it. But then there is a lot of living uh, uh, culture here. And of course, because I've had some um, family links and so on in the Nilgiris, that has been uh, something that I have uh, also been able to observe um, in a more uh, direct way. And uh, there are these cairns and cromlechs and so on, which of course were observed by uh, uh, the British who, uh, it's about 250 years since they've started uh, going into the Nilgiris and so on. And yes, looking here at a uh, Toda, Dairy Temple, which has, uh, you can see this, a circle, uh, a stone circle over there. And also this is a Kota village that you're looking at uh, on the far side and the temples to Aymanor and Amanor and the Kotas. So some of these indigenous or isolated communities or whatever we may describe, uh, you know, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, their traditions and so on, uh, you know, you can, so it's, it's, it's useful as far as ethnoarchaeology is concerned to try and look at some uh, glimpses which may uh, connect to some of these artifacts and such like. And here you're seeing, uh, again, a line of cairns in this Kota village and uh, the famous Toda buffalo as well. And here again, we are in front of one of the dairy temples, which is in, uh, uh, one of the Toda Mans. So um, when, when we look at the uh, repertoire of bronze, as I was saying, you know, there is quite a hiatus uh, following the Indus Valley or Harappan period. You have this celebrated uh, dancing girl from Mohenjo-daro. And uh, that's, it's also interesting, and I was trying to point out that, uh, you know, some of these artifacts, there are still some of these 
aspects of correlations or continuity, which I suppose could be made with many different parts of, of India and so on. But anyway, it's, it's just interesting that they do come to the mind and you automatically, when you're, uh, for instance, when I was at uh, Dholavira in this Harappan excavation, you know, it, it, it immediately comes to your mind that the dancing world had, girl has this armful of bangles, which is something that you so typically see amongst the uh, Rabari women, uh, the shell bangles and so on. And uh, of course, there is a lot of evidence of lapidary and carnelian making and so on at uh, Dolavira. And even the hair, hairdo of this dancing girl with the hair to the side, the Kota women in the Nilgiris um, also have their hair to the one side. And the Kotas, of course, there are also artisan communities amongst them, as I'll uh, show you in a bit, the blacksmiths and potters and so on. And uh, just to say that even though we, we see this as a hiatus, uh, which, which it, it is in many ways, even up to the early historic period, but there are a few um, artifacts here and there which do uh, maybe uh, uh, fill the gap to some extent. Um, for instance, you have the Daimabad uh, uh, bronze hoard of the later up in period of about 1500 BCE, <laughs> which is uh, this uh, very fine elephant, um, which is a, a solid casting. And uh, these kinds of animals on, uh, you know, animals which appear on, uh, uh, we don't quite know what those holes are meant to be. I was also thinking it you know, reminds you of these processional metal icons in South India. But then anyway, it's generally typically this animal representation and that sort of thing also carries on. You see uh, the terracotta vessels with the dog finials, for example, in Iron Age Adi Chinalur. Again, these are from some of the collections by uh, Ray and so on, which were not very uh, properly excavated, but anyway, they've been loosely dated to about 800 BCE. And you also have uh, this uh, little tiger figurine from Kodumanal of the latter part of the first millennium BC, where you also see the use of carnelian and lapis and so on, which also you find in the megalithic tradition. And there is also the intriguing mother goddess figurine from Adi Chinlur, which uh, is of metal and, and bronze, which is in the Chennai Museum and also harks back in a way to the Harappan mother goddess. You also have, we can see that there's a kind of band, waistband that she has um, uh, just around the thighs and uh, it's a kind of waistband that uh, is very, uh, the Odianam, which is very much also there in the in the time tradition, of course, that's also in, in metal, but anyway, not to say that it's that, but that kind of waistband is, something which carries on. And then you're also looking at a small uh, bit of terracotta from the Nilgiri Cairns, which is also a mother goddess depiction. I don't know, well, or rather a female depiction. I, I don't suppose we could necessarily always say that they are mother goddesses, but anyways, a similar kind of uh, um, depiction. Now in his excavations, uh, of course, Ria had uncovered, as I said, a lot of these diadems and uh, vessels, and particularly these vessels with finials, which uh, which you find both in pottery and in, in metal. There is this terracotta vessel here with the bird finial from Adi Chinlur. And uh, uh, so what is significant now is what we've been uncovering also, for instance, from Auroville, which is a similar kind of uh, depiction, but it is in bronze. And you see that uh, bird finial on top, in, in which case this is a peacock. And you can make that out clearly that uh, th those peacock feathers and all that are sort of delineated. And in Adich from Adichnur, there were also these finds of these cock finials. And um, another very extraordinary aspect was that some studies were made uh, by Paramashivan back in 1940 or so, where he reported that one of the vessels was of 23% uh, uh, bronze and he showed the microstructure. Of course, he, was, he didn't really do too much of analysis as to what exactly he was looking at. But actually, and then some subsequent studies, which I'll show, point to you um, uh, from Adi Chinura that uh, indicate that these are what we call rot and quenched height and beta bronzes of 23% tin, which is quite a, a skilled uh, technology and tradition. And as I'll try and point out that this uh, need not necessarily be seen as uh, imports because it's been generally thought that, okay, these are so finely made and they somehow don't sink with the, the pottery and so on, which don't seem to be of such a, you know, um, of, of 
which seems to have a more productive flavor. But in fact, I think there is a long-standing tradition of using uh, bronzes, and uh, 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 these are a distinctive tradition which you find in the, the this kind of region and associated also with the southern megaliths, which I will uh, elaborate a little bit more on. Um, and of course, just to point out that these, that this particular, this Auroville uh, finial, as you can see, this is a slightly, uh, this is of course a normal casting tradition where uh, perhaps it is uh, similar to what is still being done in uh, places such as in Tanjavu district, where uh, the uh, um, image is first made by wax and then encased by layers of clay to form the mold and the wax is melted out and the metal is poured in. So it's possible that, that some of it at least is 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 cast and some of it uh, as you can see the, those um you know uh, the, the bits forming the feathers and things like that um it, it, it's hard to say it seems to have been um well again it's it's interesting it's some kind of wiry uh, you know formations and things like that so uh, you know made of thin uh let's say strands of wax and so on and uh, whether they're soldered on and so on. So there's, there's a lot to be studied there to explore how these were actually made. And then I was talking about uh, why I'm talking about Adichinur and Nilgiris is they have this uh, connection in terms of the kind of material culture. And as I said, now what we're finding from Auroville and so on also um, uh, it, it sort of expands our understanding of these kinds of artifacts. And again, um, I put these slides in also, not so much to make a very firm connection, but more to provide maybe analogies because these kinds of artifacts and so on can appear at different times and points in history and so on. So there is this rather intriguing little uh, terracotta figurine also from the Nilgiri uh, Cairns, which is now in, in the British Museum. And uh, so you can see that he's wearing something which could be described as a diadem. And uh, uh, of course this, Wearing of uh, a diadem is something you also see in the celebrated piece uh, from Mohenjo-daro. And you're also looking at a gold band here from the National Museum. And uh, here you're also seeing um, a view of the Kota priest from the Nilgiris. And uh, the Kota priest is also bearded and he has a robe which goes on one shoulder and so on. So I was just struck by his appearance and I added a photograph. And of course, along with these uh, gold diadems uh, from the South Indian Iron Age sites, such as Adichinur, you also find uh, the, what are described as mouthpieces. I didn't actually have a photograph, but it is basically this diadem with uh, some kind of tangs on the side, which was probably covering on the burial and I uh, the mouth on the burial. And I think there was also another talk and it's been postulated that they, these all also have connections with the Near East and the Mediterranean and so on. So it's all uh, rather intriguing. And uh, coming back to these uh, finial vessels, now why that is important is also it helps to give some kind of context or perhaps some way of attributing some dates also to uh, some of the finds of the heightened bronzes, which I'll be discussing, because there have been some scholars like Leshnik who've suggested that uh, and he also reported the, this find, for instance, of a 21% bronze from Maula Ali and so on. And he is generally suggested that these were imports or rather, you know, being too sophisticated to have been part of this local culture and so on and imported probably from West Asia and so on. But uh, I was just also trying to point out that some of these seem to fit in with this larger kind of uh, material culture that you're seeing, uh, you know, vessels with finials and so on. And uh, here, of course, you're also seeing an Adi Chinlur pottery with this boar finial. I'd mentioned the dog finial. And then you ha have that not only in, in, in terracotta, as I said, but also in metal. And then you see this, uh, again, art vessel here from Adi Chinlur as what appear to be uh, dogs um, depicted over here. And uh, you also have from the Nilgiri cans, this is, um, uh, now from the British Museum collection, where you see the bottom of it and it is broken, but you also see uh, these finials, one of which looks a bit like a Toda buffalo to me, uh, very much uh, that kind of uh, look. So, and there have been also excavations, for instance, by Paul Hawkins in Paikara, where he suggests that some of these megaliths uh, go on uh, much later into the first millennium uh, it in CE as well. And he also suggests that there could be some connection there with the Todas and so on. And um, I was also reminded uh, this vessel from Auroville, which 
has a um, depiction of a humped cattle. Again, the humped cattle, uh, one can't help also thinking of it. It does remind us going back to the to the Harappan uh, times and so on. But anyway, that is a typical humped cattle. And these depictions of birds all around. And if you've been around, uh, you know, in Tamil Nadu and so on, it's such a common sight of these egrets sitting on cattle and so on. So that's what I was uh, very much reminded of. And also, if you see that the way those birds are made with the rays going up like that. Um, so what you're looking at here uh, is also a vessel from the uh, Vidarbha Megaliths in Maharashtra, which had also been uncovered by uh, Deo and so on. And that is one of the sites also which actually does have a carbon uh, date that was about 7th century BCE. And that particular artifact, which I'm going to talk about a bit later, is of heightened bronze. I'll discuss that. But if you see that has, again, this ray kind of uh, feature on top, which looks like some kind of a floral thing, the, 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 the stamen and so on, uh, the pistil and stamen, those kinds of uh, features of the flowers. And again, you can see how that could have been cast or made in that ray like way. So there are uh, some similarities between this kind of material culture of this period. So now coming to the, to the metallurgical aspect of it, I talked about the Chola bronzes, of course, which was the major part of what I was studying. And you're looking here at a very uh, beautiful piece of the 10th century um, um, uh, of the Chola period. And these were, of course, processional icons. And next to it, you're looking at a microstructure of a Chola bronze, which is typically here of um, cast lead bronze. Because of course, copper by itself is not very customable. So there would have been um, progressive addition of lead to make copper more castable. Um, and uh, tin is added also to make bronze a bit more harder. So this is typically cast leaded bronze. But there's also another interesting fact that of course the cast uh, chola pieces and all, you never see the tin content exceeding um, about, let's say, 15% tin. And when you look at the uh, phase diagram of copper and tin, um, the phase diagram typically shows you uh, what happens when you keep alloying one element to another element and at, uh, in, at different temperatures and such like, which has all been plotted very meticulously. So basically, um, above about 15% tin in copper, uh, the bronze starts becoming more and more brittle because below about 15%, this is what we call the alpha solid solution, where it actually goes, the tin goes into solution into copper and so on. And at that, so the alpha solid solution, it's not that brittle and so on. And very sensibly in most of the Chola pieces, uh, the tin content does not exceed 15% uh, for that reason. But for example, you're looking at a Thai bronze here, which is an as cast bronze with about 22% tin. And you can see that the hand is broken off and so on, because that typically is what would happen if you keep adding too much tin to copper in the as cast situation, that it becomes more and more brittle. However, it's quite uh, extraordinary that uh, all the way back, you know, in these, uh, context which we describe as megalithic, iron age, or early historic, whatever, you find these uh, vessels, which in this case, I'm coming back to that Adichinur vessel here. So the, that composition, you can see the microstructure below there, which is basically of a bronze, which has about 23% tin in this case. And if you look at uh, the phase diagram at a temperature between about 600 to 650 to 750 degrees, Celsius, you get the predominant formation of a beta phase of bronze. And that beta phase of bronze, uh, what happens when you rapidly cool it is that uh, when that beta phase of bronze gets retained, the embrittling uh, gets reduced because the, the delta phase, which actually causes embrittlement and all that is, is formed in the bronze. And uh, so this is basically, they were taking 23% tin bronze. And then um, in this case, very um, extraordinary is that they were forging it very extensively. That's why you see that it's, it's really, really thin, the rim of this vessel, it's extensive forging. And that's what causes these very extensive needles of beta phase, as you can see, very long, elongated needles. And so it was, uh, uh, and then quenched so that it retains this, these elongated needles. And at the bottom, you're seeing a structure, what would happen if you don't actually quench uh, bronze 
with uh, this kind of higher tin content where the beta phase would form. So wherever that uh, needle-like beta phase is, you can see it's replaced by this um, interdendritic uh, um, sort of eutectoid network, that bluish grayish network of eutectoid, which is really what embrittles the bronze. So that's how you can look at the structure and, and uh, figure out exactly what was going on, what was the thermomechanical processing. And uh, so uh, what was quite remarkable is that some of these vessels, also from the Nilgiri Cairns, which I've studied from the uh, uh, Government Museum, and there have also been a couple of studies of vessels from the Nilgiri Cairns in the British Museum. And uh, from, um, uh, as I mentioned also, Arichinur, here again, this Nilgiri vessel, you see it's a very, very fine rim, less than about, less than a millimeter, even maybe, uh, you know, going down to about, uh, less than 0.5 of a millimeter, 0.2 of a millimeter even. And uh, you find that it has these extensive needles of uh, beta phase and the alpha plus beta islands. And uh, so what was also interesting about the ethnographic study and the ethnoarchaeological study is that you can see that these sort of vessels are still being made um, till quite recently in, in uh, parts of India and Southern India and so on by the community of the Kamala, the traditional uh, blacksmithy community. And this vessel, which you'll see here, though it's made recently, which I'd uh, seen them make in the 90s. And it has exactly the same composition, as you can see, with the microstructure of needle-like beta phase and uh, alpha plus beta islands. And uh, I was talking about the brittleness, of course, uh, which is to say that the brittleness is less than if it were not quenched, but it, 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 if you were to take a hammer and break it, as this is what you see the Kamala doing, it would break. And in this case, now the craft uh, for some time has been surviving exclusively by recycling uh, the old uh, beta bronzes, unfortunately. So many of them are, are disappearing from the record. But that's also interesting because uh, really I made this connection partly because there is um, uh, a reference also which, um, uh, has been reported by, um, anyway, maybe I'll come to that later because first I'll show you how this is actually made. So you can see here that the um, ingots of uh, heightened bronze are first annealed. And here, in fact, this traditional Kamala is actually using a traditional bag bellow, buffalo skin bag bellow. Um, and then it is hammered out in these cycles of annealing and hot forging, annealing and hot forging. Annealing means heating on the flame and then hot forging and so on. And uh, once it's been shaped into that beautiful vessel with all this uh, lot of remarkable effort with these very heavy metal hammers, uh, uh, iron hammers or chirangalam, then it's finally quenched and the beta phase is retained. And the reason why this kind of alloy was also prized is that when you polish it very extensively, it gets this very golden luster, which really looks like gold. And as I was talking about the reuse, of course, of these vessels. And so you can see how they managed to, in addition to you have these vessels, which are just so finely wrought. So it's really quite extraordinary, the kind of effort that would have gone into uh, making these. Now we come to the other part of the story, which is quite interesting is that, uh, so in fact, the, the, the in, in, in the 80s, there were these um, excavations, well, in the 70s, really, of uh, the, this very interesting site in Thailand, Bandhantapet, uh, which was dated to about 4th century BCE. And uh, my uh, late advisor, Dr. Ian Lava, was also, of course, uh, 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 some of the students and all that had, had worked in this area. And so this is when, of course, with the studies by Madden and so on, so heightened bronze actually had first come to light in a more systematic way from the Southeast Asian context. And you had, uh, for instance, quite a few vessels from uh, this Bandhantapet and Kanchanapuri province, which had uh, a composition which was more than about 20%. And uh, I'll, I'll come to the microstructural details. And so there are, as I said, a similar kind of uh, thing of, but in this case, they're not very heavily wrought, as you will see. They're more like cast and quench heightened bronze of about uh, somewhere, yes, in that range of about 20 to 23% tin. But as I'll show you, the, the South Indian ones are really exploiting the property of heightened bronze much more effectively and uh, perhaps made more skillfully in that sense. 
But uh, and as you can see here, this is a slide from Bandontapet, and you see the way that this is, of course, a secondary burials here, and you see some of these vessels facing, you know, placed face down. And I was just looking also at the material that's been coming out from, uh, which came out from Ravi Peramal's excavation, which has been again loosely dated to about 500 BCE. And here you see uh, again these vessels which have been forged very heavily, and they're also placed face down like that. And you can also see that small bit of finial on in one of them, if you see, it's, it's broken off a little bit. And there are other kinds of similarities also in the vessel types. For instance, you have these vessels with the protrusion or a ridge and so on uh, in Adi Chilur and Pandu on the pet and so on. And another interesting aspect also, of course, is pointing out to you the, the, the peacock from Oroville and the Adi Chilur, the cock. And you also have this terracotta cock finial from the pottery from the Nilgiri Kens. And uh, uh, the, what you're seeing from uh, Bandantapet also with the ray-like feature below it, if you remember, that was also seen in, in uh, the, uh, some of the earlier artifacts which I had mentioned. So it, it's, it's, uh, and it's not far-fetched really to uh, think of maritime links between the Tamil region and Southeast Asia in the uh, latter part of the first millennium BCE uh, and so on, and because you also have uh, some of the Tamar Sangam poems, such as the Ertutogai, referring to a prosperous people in uh, uh, the southern part of India who traded with the island of Shavakam. And uh, also, if you see the, the Java, and if you look, look at the um, some of these uh, assemblages, uh, you know, uh, the the cockerel being featured or the peacock and so on. And so one is reminded, of course, of the worship of Murugan, uh, who is um, usually featured with the cockerel and the trident or peacock and so on. So there are some of these uh, uh, commonalities there which do uh, come to mind. And as I said, in Bandon Tepet, you also have some kind of depiction there of what seems to be a peacock and so on. And uh, you also find a feline from Bandantopet, which is of carnelian. And uh, again, you also have a tiny this tiger figurine also from Kurman. And of course, there are other kinds of associations and so on, which maybe I could describe in another talk. But uh, what I also wanted to mention was another uh, interesting uh, aspect that you find is the prevalence of these vessels, which have uh, this uh, some kind of what is described as a knob base really at the bottom, uh, you know, this kind of protrusion going up. It's very pronounced in some of the Nilgiri Ken uh, vessels where you see this very prominent knob and you and along with these rings around it. And you can see here that this is actually, it's not separately cast, it's integral to the vessel. So it's, it's from the forging process that knob base has been formed. And you can see at the bottom there, uh, again, this, this is an electron probe microanalysis uh, a uh, backscatter electron uh, uh, photograph, which again shows you that needle-like quenched beta phase of uh, this 23% beta bronze. And you're also looking in this uh, particular uh, PowerPoint slide at a hydrogen bronze from Dontabit, but you can, that's quite damaged already. And the research that shows all which is Hydrogen uh, bronze is forged well, like the uh, the example, and you can see that it's also you know broke and so on. It's not quite as uh, fabricated, and also the, the the there's that little bit of a knob there, but that seems to not be integral to the casting. Um, it's it might have been added on or something, but still there's some kind of similarities there and so on in in this. I I won't talk about this too much here because I thought I'd save something for a later talk because then that goes also into the early historic material and so on. And I don't know how I'm doing for time right now. So, uh, but I'll move on to some more aspects of the ethnoarchaeology also uh, with respect to the needs and so on. And one of the interesting aspects um, that uh, I also found in the Nilgiris uh, where my, um, uh, uh, is that when we'd been to this, um, the house of some of the Todas and the Toda community, many of them also keep and collect these uh, vessels, which clearly seem to be of heightened bronze. And of course, there was a long-standing tradition, as I said, of making them 
also in Kerala and, and, and Trichur and so on. I've talked about it in various other talks. And as you can see here, uh, you know, many of them actually keep them and use them for various uh, ritual aspects and so on. And also some of the pottery types that you see, there's still a continuing tradition of making um, some of this kind of handmade pottery as you see. Uh, and the pottery is done mainly by the women. This is a Kota lady here uh, from Sholur um, uh, who was uh, had all these pottery um, uh, pieces and so on. And she also has a kiln over there. So there is this, uh, uh, division of labor here, where it's the men who are the blacksmiths and the women who are the potters. And you're also looking at uh, one of the workshops of uh, the blacksmith in this Kota Kokal in Koli Malay, uh, and, and the priest is also there and so on. So, well, I was also pointing to the blacksmithy because um, we do know that the Kotas were artisans and so on. And uh, so, and the blacksmithy has continued amongst them. Of course, they don't do any bronze smithy anymore, but at least we can say that there is some tradition of smithy there. Uh, whether these vessels were made locally from around, let's say, uh, you know, some other parts of um, uh, Southern India, because I, uh, I, I think this was also being practiced in places like the Tanjavur district and all that, but it's died out in recent times, it survived more in Kerala and so on. So whether these were coming in from there or whether they were also local uh, blacksmiths and, uh, who were also bronze smiths and some things like that is also um, an interesting point. And now I was also talking about this vessel from Marjorie, as I said, this is from uh, Deo's excavation in, in um, and you can see that that is also uh, the microstructure as you're seeing it below, that is also a rotten quench height and bronze, but the tin content is not um, exactly going towards the beta phase content, which is about 23% tin, but it is 21% tin. And you see this uh, needle-like uh, beta phase from the quenching. But here you also see that there is a dendritic structure in the alpha phase. So it's not been uh, forged as extensively. It's been more lightly cast and quenched. So the Tamil examples seem to have been very extensively hot forged. I would say that had taken the uh, hot forging uh, technology to uh, really its limit. And uh, there was a study that I'd also made with um, uh, uh, Professor Sherby, who's more, uh, you know, it was found that the beta phase was what we call quasi super plastic, which means that it shows high formability at uh, high temperatures. It's not quite super plastic, but it is approaching that and so on. So that also explains how they could forge it to, you know, this very, very extraordinary uh, thinnesses. And just to also point out that this kind of, you know, bits and bobs of finials with these rays and so on, you also find that from, uh, other megaliths, uh, such as Kodumanal also, you find uh, these, of course, some of them are broken and damaged and so on. And there was also an excavation in Kerala more uh, recently by Ramesh, which has a copper alloy finial with that same kind of uh, uh, the, the motif, floral motif and so on. Um, so there is a certain overarching kind of uh, uh, let's say similarities there in the material culture, uh, which we can uh, say that, you know, this, of course, there may have been interactions with different parts of the world and so on, but there is something which is distinctive, let's say, or, or uh, you know, which one can look at as slightly more characteristic and so on for what it's worth. And I've also put in this um, uh, photograph of a painting by the Kurumbas. The Ala Kurumbas are honey gatherers in the Nilgiris. And uh, you see that this painting uh, depicts various stages in honey gathering and so on. And the pigments that they use are made from tree resin and herbs and so on. And so here you can see that uh, there is uh, some kind of circle of stones and something inside it, which you could describe it as a, a, a menhe or a megalith, or maybe in today's terms, you could call it a shivling or whatever, but or rather some kind of precursor to something like that, or a column or whatever. And the honey gatherers are dancing around. So there are these aspects of intangible heritage also, which, uh, you know, I think need to be explored with respect to megaliths and living traditions and so on. And uh, I have also put this, um, uh, the photograph just above there of the Kurunji flowers, because of course the Kurunji is a very, um, uh, let's say, a very iconic feature of the Nilgiris as well. 
which blossoms once in 12 years, this beautiful um, violet uh, colored um, flower. And it's also interesting, of course, that in the Sangam literature, the Kurunji refers to the, to the mountainous areas. So in this case, there is a connection here, perhaps they are, you know, refer to the mountainous, mountainous areas such as the Nilgiris and so on, because this is where the Kurumbi, Kurunji um, blossoms uh, you know, and carpets the place once in 12 years. And maybe that also is what the Nilagiri also refers to and so on. Anyway, so these are some of the Kurumba dancers and musicians over here. So as I was saying that they do dance around in a circle with uh, some of the musicians and some of that music also, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's almost like it matches with the sounds of, you know, the bees and so on. And it's, it's very, very beautiful to watch in its own way, but they do dance around like that in, in circles. And uh, of course, those are the Ala Kurumbas, but there are the, also the Beta Kurumba communities. And uh, so many years ago, uh, now it's also interesting that in the Sangam literature, you also find references to a uh, gold merchant from uh, Tulunadu, as it's broadly called. So Tulunadu, of course, could more broadly refer to the West Coast of uh, Southwest India of course, uh, now in Karnataka and so on, but more broadly that Southwest coast. And also, uh, um, uh, you also find that there is evidence for these old gold workings in the Nilgiris, especially in the Gudalur area and so on. And in this case, these are some of these hard rock mines where basically the, um, so of course gold uh, occurs in the native state and usually you can find the veins of gold in auriferous quartz. And what you're looking at here are these auriferous quartz veins and there are some of these tunnels which are going through and so on. And of course this may have been worked till, uh, you know, we don't know whether according to some records it may have been something which was also in the, uh, you know, carrying on to the Tipu era and so on. Um, and of course, but the fact that the gold had been prospected and worked out quite extensively, uh, McLaren says that, you know, that the gold fields presented an uninviting prospect because it's all been worked out so heavily and so on. So it seems to have been worked out quite a lot in antiquity and even uh, several in the 19th century also mentions that uh, observances of the Beta Kurumba uh, you know, being involved in the mining of gold and so on. So we had actually, um, you know, and basically what happens was that you have the auriferous quartz in the hills and then um, the stream gold gets washed down with the rain and so on and washes down into the streams. And uh, typically the stream gold is collected by panning where these wooden pans are used and the heavier gold uh, sort of segregates into the bottom of the pan and the lighter particles such as quartz and silica and so on, those are washed away. And in this case, because, you know, these have become so uneconomical that really extracting gold from them is, is like a very, very difficult task. But here, these are children who were um, using, in fact, the mercury amalgamation technique and so on. I won't go into that here, maybe a further talk and so on. But uh, uh, so they were extracting even these very minor amounts of gold and so on. So they're quite skilled, really, even even the children and so on. And uh, so in this slide, you're seeing some of the uh, gold finds from the Nilgiri Cairns, which are also now in the British Museum, uh, some kind of floral motif, and also these, uh, what we call the gold microbeads. Now, it's also interesting that these gold microbeads, again, um, may be completely separated context, but you also have microbeads of gold being found in, from Mohenjo-daro, for example, in the National Museum, where uh, the gold, they form uh, perfect uh, spheres due to the surface tension and so on. And of course, you also find, uh, and I also put in uh, the, the Sutakeni uh, gold, which has been, uh, you know, rot hammered. And the Kiridi gold, again, you find, uh, different depictions of floral patterns, of floral motifs, which are very typical to some of the finds of gold from uh, these early Tamil contexts. And so, of course, we don't, uh, this is again a very interesting question. Maybe we'll take a look into it in a future talk as to you know whether the outside influences and so on and what those may have been, if at all. But there is a case here for the, you know, the, the local use and the local exploitation of gold. And these could have well been, um, you know, in that sense, you don't have to really invoke an external source in terms of uh, the, uh, the occurrence of uh, gold in the megalithic 
Iron Age or early historic or whatever you call, might call it in Tamil Nadu. And another uh, in, uh, point, this is, I think, my last slide, and I think I've almost uh, run out of time here. So, um, of course, I talked about the connection between uh, Southeast Asia and uh, Tamil Nadu uh, in terms of the kind of material culture, you know, the finds of those kinds of similar looking vessels. However, when you look at the, um, because one of the things, of course, that, uh, you know, uh, perhaps gave strength to this argument that some of these heightened bronzes, especially, uh, were probably not uh, local in, in terms of the Indian context, is because there isn't a lot of tin. So it seems more logical that this technology would have emerged in a context where there is a lot of tin available. And Southeast Asia has a lot of uh, tin. It's a very tin-rich um, uh, area. Um, however, when you actually, uh, when uh, actually one looks at the comparison between the analysis of some of these vessels from um, the southern Indian context, the Nilgiri and Adichinur vessels, and the vessels from Bandhautapet and the Thai regions, so the trace elements are not uh, that similar, so as to suggest that they had similar sources, because, for instance, the Thai um, uh, vessels seem to have, you know, more traces of silver and antimony and so on, which are much lower in the uh, South Indian examples. And uh, so I, I would think that it's not very likely that these are actually um, made, you know, in Southeast Asia and exported. As I said, even the technology suggests a lot more sophistication in terms of the forging and so on in the South Indian context, which still survives today. And also very curiously, I also came across slags. And I'm just mentioning this, that we also need to uh, recognize that when it comes to alluvial deposits, uh, like gold, of course, it gets worked out, but tin also um, tends to be, um, tends to occur, the cassiterite ores tend to occur as placer tin deposits or alluvial tin. So if alluvial tin deposits, even if they had been sparring and if they were there and they had been worked out, they would not leave much of a record. And uh, so, for example, I came across these slides, which is from... Uh, Kalyadi in Karnataka, of course, these are surface finds and so on. But interestingly, they contained um, the metallic content in these slags. The slags are the waste from uh, the uh, metal processing. And the slags, I won't go into the detail too much this time, but just to suggest that uh, these slags contain 7% tin bronze in them. And they also had a lot of iron content, metallic iron content, which seems to suggest that this was a very high smel high temperature smelting process. And these this seems to have been bronze formed by some co-smelting process. Well, um, it's just to point out that so unexpectedly, there is some case for some local usage of tin or local mines of tin or tin ores and so on, uh, some local traditions as well. So we can't uh, rule out the possibility that uh, also, you know, in the uh, alluvial gold occurrences, there are some uh, very minor uh, deposits of tin, which are also reported uh, by geologists and so on, for instance, in the North Attica area. So whether some exploitation had taken place of that kind. So these are all, I suppose, um, uh, questions for the future. Or whether it was, even if it was the copper sources were different, whether tin, tin was being um, imported as metal by itself and then alloyed and so on. But anyway, the, so these are all the questions for further investigations. So what we could say, though, is that the there seems to be um, uh, some similarities here between the material culture between Tamil Nadu and Southeast Asia, but the the objects uh, seem to have been made uh, in those regions with slight variations and so on. And, and uh, certainly the heightened bronze technology seems to have been uh, quite uh, uh, well spread out also in, in, in India and the Southern Indian region. And there is also the um, uh, a very fascinating account of Niak uh, of uh, Strabo in Strabo's geography, where he mentions that uh, Niakus is one of Alexander's generals, uh, talks about how Indians were using uh, uh, vessels which shattered like pottery. And of course, other scholars like Seeley also have observed that that could well refer to heightened bronzes. And this was, of course, in the Indus region and so on. Um, and uh, because that depiction of you know vessels which shattered like pottery could uh, you know well fit what is mentioned about the heightened bronzes and incidentally that's how I actually uh, 
came to look for these heightened bronze vessels because when I was talking to my grandmother, when I was just beginning to go out there and do my field work, she mentioned that, you know, in Trichur, they used to make these vessels, which if you dropped it accidentally, then it would just break like that, like pottery. And that's when I realized that she was talking about something very similar, which, which is how I set off there. And I went, we went looking around uh, Trichur and so we came across the scrap shops there and then went up to Palakkad and so on and found the traditions of uh, high bronze working. So I'll stop there because I think there's a lot to be said, of course, on this uh, topic of the Ferris and, you know, going on to the early historic and other contexts. And of course, we need to also preserve these sites. You're looking at the Arikamedu Lagoon and megaliths are constantly being uh, destroyed as well. Uh, this is Hire Benkel. Every time we go, we, we see less and less of our... Uh, uh, favorite spots. So there's a huge, um, uh, you know, a, a huge amount of work there for us in this area of heritage and heritage preservation and megaliths and so on. But it's a very exciting topic and I hope I've, um, well, raised more questions and really answered them, which I think <laughs> is what uh, makes the subject relevant, you know, interesting to Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, Stop the slide share there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Sharda Srinivasan, for your excellent presentation and overview of uh, copper bronze technology from the Iron Age down to the uh, living tradition in the contemporary context and among the uh, Nilgiri communities. There are some uh, questions uh, in the chat uh, box. Can you read it? by yourself or do you want me to read? Uh, Six. So I just click the chat. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Yeah. So as I said, I couldn't cover everything in this uh, particular topic, but I uh, there's a question here about the copper sources. And uh, so I have done some surveys and uh, also um, uh, published about that, but um, for instance, there are, Karnataka has sources in uh, Tintini and Ingaldal. Ingaldal also, I published a paper in that. There's also some evidence for Shatavahana period extraction of uh, copper there and so on. And also in, in Andhra Pradesh, the uh, Guntur district area and so on. So, and, and Tamil Nadu also has, in fact, Adi Chinlur itself is, is supposed to be quite close to some uh, copper workings and there are, uh, you know, but, but of course we need to do much more systematic uh, studies and so on to really, um, uh, it, it's quite a, it, it's a very major job really to do trace element correlations and also of the, the, the ores from the mines and so on. But there are copper ores in Southern India, which uh, certainly in the early periods, they would have not been totally uneconomical. Maybe in later periods, they would have been needed to have been so supplementing and such like that. But very likely in these early periods, there could have been uh, some local sources. We can't rule that out here. Yeah. What is this? Um, yeah. Uh, next, there is one uh, question by Kumanan. Uh, yeah, would you tell? Sorry? Yeah. yeah. Uh, there is one question by Kumanan. There are yeah. light uh, bronze balls from uh, Dayan Kingdom of Kingdom period in China, yeah. uh, which has finials with bulls and buffaloes. Are there yeah. any comparative literature that examines the original copper artifacts with those made in China, Vietnam, and Sembiran Valley, copper smelting sites excavated? He's asking if there is any comparative study uh, of the metallurgical study of the samples from India as well as those from Southeast Asia and China. Yeah, those kind of comparative studies. I, I um, how do you mean comparative? You mean comparative in terms of the the, the uh, metal no, analysis or the well, the, the other thing is of course the Dong Song culture. It it is a bit similar, but it is quite distinctive as well. Each of those are quite distinctive. So I think unless there's a very strong reason for uh, you know a, a comparison. Uh, so to that extent, it's not yet been done. I suppose we do need to, I, I am actually working on some um, uh, projects to do with comparing with Southeast Asia, but that's in a very preliminary sort of way, but it certainly needs more uh, work and so on. Um, okay. You know, yeah. yeah. There, there is one more uh, 
Question. But the Dian Kingdom, it's slightly different. It's not quite, uh, you know, the, 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 yeah, there are echoes of it, but, uh, and, and this is, you know, this kind of thing you find with Phineas, even the Etruscans, so it's, it's spread across many parts of the world, though in its, it's, it's in, a, in, in its own sort of distinctive way, you know, vessels with the Phineas and such like. Yeah. Okay, so, then there is a question. So he, he's from the same person, Tin content in Tamil artifacts compared with tin extraction sites in Malaya, Java, and Vietnam. But you know, I have to tell people who are asking all these questions that, you know, scientific work is not trivial. It needs funding. It needs this. It needs that. Okay. And we are constantly struggling even to keep our researchers and this and that. So, you know, everything can't be answered in a packed kind of thing. It takes okay, time. Okay, it takes okay. effort. It takes systematic work. It needs support. You know, so people I find are just they just pose questions as if you know this is just a magic wand it's not like that it, it all of it takes a lot of effort yeah, yeah. and i so, think we should be very cautious and not be too uh, sweeping in our statements we shouldn't make categorical remarks whatever little we can do in a very uh, solid way to advance the you know state of research that's mm -hmm. i think uh, the, the approach rather than looking at the grand picture and wanting to you know leap into it in a so you know small small steps towards sustained effort is really what we need yeah Okay. okay, so these are the questions on the. But it's very marks. exciting that there is all yeah. this, you know, interest in, and it, yeah, it is yeah. definitely, I think, the fascinating aspect is all of this cross cultural, um, you know, ways of looking and so on. Yeah. Uh, any of the participants here want to ask uh, any questions? Any of those present in this uh, Zoom uh, platform? Hello, Arjun or uh, anybody else? Uh, Namita yeah. or uh, anybody else, if you have any questions, you can ask. Otherwise, I'll move on to the Facebook. Uh, uh, can, I, can I ask one, okay. one question? It's, it's more of a comment, I guess, more thinking about yes, all these sure. connections with Southeast Asia and so on. And there was that more recent, I think, uh, uh, discovery or, or I guess article confirming that the, um, that the chicken had been domesticated in Southeast Asia. So to me, I think that that sort of further solidifies the connection um, and, and going beyond metallurgy. I think those are other things that we can look at to think about um, sort of the, the cross-cultural interactions uh, mm. as well. But that's what I was thinking of when you were showing those images and, and, and so on. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, uh, we, you know, looking at it in silos is probably not, uh, you know, and the other thing, of course, is probably you know, the story of the rice and, you know, when, <laughs> what goes from where and so on. So there's, I guess, a lot of um, um, interesting kinds of things there. And for instance, you know, even the other thing in the, in the iron metallurgy, for instance, in the Thai context, you find uh, some things you should describe as these billboard hooks or something, and nobody knew what they were. But then finally, when you look around, or you know, in so many parts of India, that's you know, it's what we call the Aruan Mane or something in, in, in Tamil Nadu, and I'm sure it's found that's just exactly what they use for chopping, uh, you know, vegetables or this or that, and in many parts of India, probably. And it's and you find that um, the ethno archaeology is also quite interesting there in terms of uh, maybe understanding all of this. So I'm sure, uh, you know, that's. Very true that one can't look at it in isolation, absolutely. Yeah. Sure. And I think what it also does, both of these sort of examples, sort of brings up the issue of, of multidirectionality and bidirectionality, because often the focus is what is going into Southeast Asia. That's true. And the influence but there. But here... Be, yes. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, I think it needs to, um, you know, there's certainly that um, aspect of it. That's a kind of the, the idea of this greater India, whatever that's, it's, I think, a two-way uh, traffic there. So it mm. would be interesting to keep sight of that as well. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's interesting also the points that were made about the the um, the Dian material and so on, which, of course, I've seen. It looks completely different, though. But, I mean, in, in principle, yes, those kind of ideas could, uh, you know, uh, inform different parts of the world and, you know, move that way and so on. So, yeah. Um, and also, of course, the, the beads, which we haven't talked about, right? The Indo-Pacific beads and so on. There's yeah, so much of right. that as well, which mm -hmm. I think we need to have a, an, another talk coming more into the, uh, you know, uh, 
those kinds of connections and so on. But you, for example, I mean, of course, we mean you find that there are some Indo-Pacific beads which from Arikamedu, which are of you know the soda soda glass, which are exactly what you also find in uh, you know one of the sites in Thailand and so on. So exactly all of this and how and what and <laughs> lots to unravel there. Okay, then next, uh, Arjun Rao, can you yeah. uh, present your question uh, by yourself? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was also thinking it would be wise to hear from Professor Shadar Srinivasan mm. on the possible uh, methodological uh, steps that can be taken up by the uh, mm. upcoming researchers to particularly point at uh, the provenance or to look into the uh, Aran methodology and its functionalities. Yeah, so iron is a huge topic. I think I'll have to take that up in a different uh, talk. But uh, yeah, so, so in terms of methodology, yeah, um, I, you're just looking, looking at the morphological or the macro examination and things or the actual microstructure, because I think those that's also, you know, it needs both sides in a way to really get a more complete picture because um, you know, whether something is a nail, uh, I guess, you know, when you look at a point and see whether it's, it's it's made of wrought iron or if it's steel or something. So maybe I'll take that question up in a different talk when I talk more about iron and things like that and also, you know, reflect on aspects of it a bit more and yeah. answer because, that more fully. Yeah. Because most often, uh, yeah. archaeologists, when they are finding the megalithic sites or iron age sites, they mm. tend to compare Mm. the uh, iron source to a very far distant uh, locations. So sometimes it also uh, makes us to think uh, there could have also been a nearby sources which uh, we don't know because the common idea of iron mining goes to the modern uh, method of mining that we have to go deeper into the earth. We ignore uh, the possibility of uh, sources from the surface or Oh, definitely. I mean, see, with iron, uh, you know, iron ore also, again, a lot of it is available as magnetite, which is stream iron, you know, the black sand that you see. And uh, so th there was probably a lot of, uh, you know, uh, iron ore all over. In fact, South India had a lot of iron ore, it still does, the Kudrimok and so on. So it's very rich in iron ore in many places you find banded ferruginite. Uh, ores and yeah. so on. So I think that iron was something which we don't have to really invoke these very far away sources and so on in the way that we do maybe for tin simply because it's not that easily available or whatever. So I think iron would have been definitely a, a lot of case for it being, uh, you know, uh, using local laws. But again, I suppose, um, you know, the, the, this uh, the more systematic provenance, I think, needs to. We need to have access to artifacts more easily, also, and labs, and so many things to be able to do all of that. So it's it's a big wish list. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I have one more query, probably yeah. the last one. Uh, of course, the morphology to... as well and the types. Yeah. Sorry, I seem to not hear you. Yeah, it's uh, very true that we have a very limited resources. Uh, in terms of laboratory and archaeometallurgists like you, and uh, the right uh, people to bring the uh, systematic samples to the lab as well. So th these problems are there. Uh, I have just one more query. I think we can take up uh, owing to the time. Uh, if you look at the charcoalithic culture, uh, I mean, it has been archaeologically uh, explained to be the copper using uh, cultures copper using cultures. So in the southern part of India, the uh, Neolithic, uh, some, some claim there is a charcoalithic phase stating to be Neolithic charcoalithic, but it is very meager compared to the uh, central part of Indian charcoalithic phase. So what could be this uh, reason behind that? Uh, is it uh, something to uh, geographical factors or uh, how do you see this uh, kind of developments? Yeah, well, um, one thing is that iron is quite plentiful anyway in, in southern India and whether it's just that um, once they, you know, were aware of the use of iron, because iron makes for much better tools and so on and the other, and I suppose the copper would have been something you, 
in, in the sense that you needed it for, for, for tools and so on when you didn't have the iron, but once you have iron and you're able to use it, um, so the copper would be really mainly for the ritual purposes and, and maybe for things like the vessels and the you know more uh, limited uses of, of that. And perhaps there was enough of good and you know with the good black and white pottery, maybe the, again they had enough of the the, the, the vessels were also uh, you know they had material to make that. So a lot of it is also about perhaps what is uh, what is functional and what they actually need. And uh, of course, one thing is there that when you look at the Chalcolithic cultures like Ahar and all, I mean, Rajasthan is definitely at the next level in terms of mineral resources. The richness of the mineral resources is, is of a different scale. So, you know, finding more ores and this and that would be probably, um, uh, um, uh, you know, would have been more readily kind of uh, available to use and things like that. So the, 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 maybe the lack of, I mean, I won't say it's not there, it's definitely there in Southern India, the, the copper resources and all, but perhaps not on that scale. Whereas iron is actually quite, as I said, the magnetite sands and so on and the other, in, you know, there's, a, there's quite a lot of iron. So um, whether that could be one aspect of it and so on. But I mean, you know, you are finding, um, uh, I suppose, Occasionally, but even even for instance, with these uh, these vessels, I mean that's what really comes to you as a surprise that it's seen as being you know uh, you know there's very little of it, but still there are some more and more of it coming up. So I guess we have. I mean, if you look at Arjunur alone, the number of uh, you know it's actually one of the largest sites that you have uh, in, in India of of not just antiquities but also of vessels and so on, if you look at what was recorded, all the Nilgiris, but of course, many of them are not here, they're quite, you know, in other parts of India. And the other thing, of course, don't forget is that, uh, especially with copper, uh, it can be remelted. So that could also be one major factor where you don't find, um, you know, much of it in the record, because it just gets remelted and reused. And you find that even today with these heightened bronzes, they're just being mercilessly remelted all the time. And I think that was a very organized tradition of reuse and remelting going back, you know, quite a long time, uh, you know, because that's, that's, the, that's the beauty about uh, copper alloys, they can be remelted and reused. So what we have, whether that actually represents a record, you know, we don't know. In some places, those that have been hoarded, like, don't forget that even the, what the chalcolithic, what we find, for instance, the gengetic, those are all the hoards, the copper hoards, whatever was hoarded away and so on. But, uh, you know, there, uh, so there wasn't even that tradition of burying, you know, um, vessels and so on, like, like you would find in the West and so on. So there is a lot of that as well. We don't know what has, you know, been uh, in that sense lost due to, to reuse and remelting and so on. So, so that way it will be a bit of an incomplete record, I guess. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, it was indeed uh, a learning experience looking at your uh, research works. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure and a very enlightened and very interesting and relevant discussion. So, so thank yeah, you so thank much you. For this one, um, one last question from Ajit Kumar, um, uh, from yes. Ajit Kumar from um, uh, Kerala University, former professor. There are ancestor bronze figures with certain communities in Nilambur region of Kerala. Has anyone done any study on that? He says that there are certain ancestor figures among the communities of uh, Nilambur in Kerala. He's asking if any had, anybody has done any studies on them. Yeah, well, that would uh, be another very interesting aspect because in Nilambur is yeah. also where you get a lot of gold and so on. Well, I have to say, I have actually analyzed some of the bronze from Porkalam, which is in the Trichur uh, Museum, which is also megalithic. And that's not heightened bronze, but it is, it's, it's unleaded bronze. So you can see okay. that there is this move towards using definitely unleaded bronze and expertise in using unleaded bronze. And some of it is also the kind of finial kind of thing, because that's also one thing, which is why I see this heightened bronze doesn't emerge in a vacuum, because there is a longstanding tradition of using unleaded bronze. And maybe that's because, um, uh, you know, maybe there was not that much lead available. That could be one reason, but also because um, in itself, you know, uh, working, uh, 
uh, you know, even unleaded bronze is a certain, it, it takes a certain level of skill and so on and manipulation. And that seems to have been, even if you look at, uh, for instance, the Harappan period, you'll find there's a lot more use of bronze, which has no lead, you know, it, it's unleaded bronze is used a lot. So there, I think there's been a long standing uh, experience with that perhaps, which has led to then, then you keep adding more and more amounts of tin and you find empirically what, you know, happens with that and so on. So as I said, even in Porculum you find, but I, I haven't actually looked at the Nilambur uh, material, it, you know, would be an interesting aspect. Yeah, as well. maybe, maybe you can take it up for your Yes, so uh, only too happy to collaborate with, uh, you know, people though we, <laughs> as difficult as things are, it's always nice to, you know, yeah. be in touch. I and, think, uh, uh, the, these are the uh, questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. These are the questions. There are no more uh, questions from the participants. So indeed, I like uh, the your observation that uh, the Southeast Asia could be one possible source for this. So though I have uh, uh, looked at some of the evidence, I have not thought about it deeply. As uh, Namida pointed out, it is this bidirectional context and also as uh, Arjun Rao pointed out you know we don't have much uh, uh, copper source and no clear uh, calcolithic culture we have neolithic and then we have iron age and probably uh, as you said these uh, copper bronze artifacts had a ritual role even in the temple if you look in South India in the medieval context extensively they use copper for uh, you know in the temple uh, rituals Copper is mainly preferred, and maybe that tradition goes back to the earlier time. People also use them for uh, rituals and offering. The more we see with uh, uh, these kind of animals, peacock, and they, there is one probability that they were associated with rituals or festival. That is uh, interesting. And uh, we would like to thank you on behalf of Asian Megalist Group for taking your time and giving us the main insights into the copper bronze uh, metallurgy. As you pointed out, if you, uh, when you get time, if you talk more about your research, mainly on the uh, mines, uh, copper bronze mining in South India and iron technology in future uh, lecture, that will be great. And thank you so much for uh, spending time with us and presenting your insights on this uh, copper brands metallurgy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I will add to that to say that I, I do think that these artifacts are made in, in Southern India because of the fact that they, uh, that technology doesn't seem to be found, you know, in that sense, in that mm -hmm. uh, prominent way there, but it, it, it's, it's the possibility that maybe the metal could have been uh, you know, that, that could have come. Yeah, but so, I think that yeah. I, what my study has managed to do is at least to show that it's it's not far-fetched to think that these vessel, vessels and all that were made within Southern India. That I think is established yeah. more and more. So that I think is also an interesting. But thank you very much for those, uh, you know, very important comments. And your point about the ritual use of, you know, these kinds of yeah, vessels. Yeah. I think th that ethnography also has to be explored a bit more, which was why, you know, as I said, with the with the, uh, with the Nilgiri communities and so on, I think this is, uh, you know, the, the living tradition also with what we understand as megalithic and all that is also quite interesting and important, I think, so to make those connections. So thank you. It's been okay. a thank pleasure. You. And, thank uh, you all forward. for uh, coming over here and listening to Professor Sharda Srinivasan. Thank you, Arjun, and thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah.